at Frederick Community College, and her topic is A New Dawn for Women of Oman. Where can we track her? Uh, Are you finding that? Well, there's, I see the slide. Yes? Yes, I see the, yes, yes very nice. Great. All right. Um, I need to do something with my screen. There we go. I'm sorry, I'm just making adjustments here. Hmm. All right. Um, well, good afternoon, good evening to, to you all. Um, I wish to thank Dr. Kamau and the Journal of Arabic and World Literature and Andromeda Publishing thank you. for convening this very important conference celebrating Arab women as agents of change and progress. And I'd like to offer my congratulations to the organizing committee for their outstanding efforts. It is an honor for me to share my observations and perspectives on this subject, particularly with such distinguished colleagues. While I am aware that I am the last featured speaker in a two-day symposium that has been filled with many compelling presentations, I will endeavor to, endeavor to rise to the challenge and to do my utmost to hold your attention and interest by discussing the role of women in the Sultanate of Oman, a country that stands as one of the few good news stories in the Middle East. As a student and teacher of the Middle East, I have traveled the region for decades. I visited Oman for the first time at the dawn of its modern Renaissance in Nahda, and have returned no less than two dozen times, interviewing hundreds of its citizens in every corner of the land. My remarks today are merely suggestive of a manuscript that I will soon complete, inshallah, for publication on the subject. In this context, your comments, suggestions are most warmly welcome. To the extent that it is monolithic, which of course it is not, the narrative of the women of Oman as agents of change and progress, as architects of their own destinies, diverge in many ways from the experiences of their sisters in other societies of the MENA region, including those of their immediate neighbors. I've been reminded these last two days about the experiences that shaped the pioneering work of such female icons as Noelle Stawi and Leila Ahmed from Egypt and their sisters in North Africa, Fatima Mirnisi and those in the Levant. I am struck by a certain degree of contrast between them and the women of the Khalij, especially Oman. Women in Oman have also enjoyed an awakening in the modern era, greater opportunity and with it, empowerment and agency. But to a large extent, their path has been quite different. In the case of Oman, the legacy of colonialism and the accumulated baggage that generally accompanies that experience is largely absent. Oman is the oldest independent country in the Arabian Peninsula, having cast out first the Persians and later the Portuguese more than 350 years ago. For centuries, it has been identified as Oman, a recognizable political entity, an honor shared in Arabia only with Yemen. It is one of the oldest countries in the Middle East. It has been ruled by the same royal family since 1744. 
Among the people of Oman, cultural identity, born of centuries of shared history, is deeply embedded. Omanis know who they are, know where they've been, and today have a fairly good idea of where they are going. Theirs is a story of challenge, resilience, and tenacity in history as well as in the modern age. The women of Oman have been and remain integral to this vision. Oman is a country that remains under the radar, not only in the mainstream media, but also to a large extent in the context of Middle East studies and women's studies. I put up these uh, statistics just to familiarize you with the country. It's distinguished, as I've mentioned, from its neighbors and others uh, in many respects, but in the Khalij, you note that uh, the population of um, Omanis in their own country is around 60%, which stands, of course, in stark contrast to that of their neighbors, which is the United Arab Emirates, which we heard about earlier this morning. Uh, it is also uh, a country which is Islamic in every way, but is distinguished from others in the region because the predominant sect or tradition in Oman is the Ibadi, Sunnis, Shia live there as well, with an almost complete absence of sectarian divisions, which again is this day and age rather extraordinary. I tend to view my subject from a historical lens and um, a geographic lens as well, because I believe that the story of Oman is the story of its geography as destiny. Its geography has shaped the worldview of the people of Oman. It has made the country a country that values interaction, not insularity. And it is a country with a rich maritime history. And you can see this clearly by these maps. With the desert at its back and the Indian Ocean at its doorstep, Oman lies at the crossroads of ancient and modern trade routes. In the ancient world, Oman, known as Majin, was one of the most significant transit hubs in the ancient world. It was a major entrepot among historic trade routes, both by land, but especially by sea. Merchants were skilled in maritime navigation. Trading with people of ancient Sumeria and the Indus Valley, Oman made its mark on global exchange and commerce as a source of copper, vital to the manufacture of bronze and frankincense, a resin derived from the Boswellia sacra tree, valued more highly than gold by Caesars and pharaohs, emperors and popes for religious and ceremonial occasions. Omani women have been essential to the development of Oman since very ancient times. As Jana Amin reminded us yesterday, and I quote, Arab women are not just starting to take control of their own narrative. And in the case of Oman, that is surely the case. Women have been participating in the national life of Oman way before the era of modernization in a materially significant way, largely because of Oman's role as a maritime nation and as a colonial power. Before the Islamic age, Queen Shamsa of Oman was a powerful figure and remains so in the collective memory of the Omani people. She was queen of Oman in the third millennia BC and was known particularly for making a very uh, important trade agreement with the, the Akkadian king Sargon, whose daughter I discovered this morning, thank you very much, uh, was um, Enduana. 
Omani women also take their inspiration from uh, Islamic history and particularly the earliest years of Islam. And this, I'm reminded of this when I do speak with Omani women, the role model of Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and of course, Aisha, uh, warrior, uh, compiler of Hadith, very important in the collective memory of Omani women. Women were participating in national life before the era of modernization, largely because of Oman's role as a maritime power and as a colonial power. Uh, the Dao is the iconic vessel of the Omani peoples and the labor of Omani women was critical to the commercial endeavors of their society as they painstakingly wove thousands upon thousands of miles of sturdy rope made of coconut palm fiber used to join the timbers of these hand-sewn majestic sailing ships in every sea of the world. During all this time, women were integral to the successful operation of society in Oman, particularly as custodians of continuity. Omani sailors and merchants were absent absent from home for extended periods of time, for months, often for years at a time. Supported in part by remittances from abroad, Omani women retained order at home, remaining in their villages, assuming responsibility for the day-to-day -day management of their households. They ensure the community's welfare by overseeing finances, defending themselves, managing the life-sustaining felaj systems, and even issuing fetwas, effectively acting as guarantors of societal stability and cohesion. And uh, I, if you will indulge me, I am sharing with you also today some of the uh, photos I took in Oman at the very beginning of the Renaissance in the early 70s uh, during my first visits to the Sultanate. Women continued to assume important roles. Throughout the age of empire, Oman was indeed not colonized, but was a colonial power itself. In the 19th century, the Omani Empire ruled from the island of Zanzibar. Its territory stretched from Southern Arabia to the Horn of Africa, to the Northern border of Portuguese controlled Mozambique and Zanzibar and beyond. But alas, shortly after the death of Sultan Said the Great, toward the end of the 19th century, Oman's fortunes began to fade for a number of reasons. Oman slipped quietly into obscurity during the second half of the 19th century. It was known in the early 20th and mid 20th century as the Hermit Kingdom, the Tibet of the Middle East, a medieval backwater, isolated, impoverished, xenophobic. With 10 kilometers of paved road in the entire country, all in the capital of Muscat. There was no national infrastructure. There were a total of three schools in the entire country, all for boys with a total enrollment of 900. The only hospital facilities were manned and women by largely American missionaries in the country. The country at the dawn of the Renaissance was racked by a long secessionist war in the south, in the Far, and repeated attempts to usurp the Sultan's power in the north. And this was during the era of Sultan Said bin Taimur, who reigned from 1932 to 1970. He was overthrown in a palace coup on July 23rd, 1970 by his son, the 29-year-old Qaboos bin Said. Qaboos had a new message for the people of Oman. My people, my brothers, 
Yesterday, it was complete darkness. With the help of God, tomorrow will be a new dawn on Muska, Oman, and its people. And I love including these photos because A, I love to take photos of children, but also I would like you to note the dress of the people of Oman back in the day. They were colorful, they were patterned, um, they were bedecked with silver jewelry, nary a black abaya in sight, which is also a very interesting topic for discussion if we have time. Sultan Qaboos bin Said announced that there were tw two twin pillars of development that he would pursue, education and healthcare. This is 1970. Three primary schools for boys, no public schools for girls. He embarked upon a rigorous program of building schools and educating children even under the shade of trees. Children were schooled in the, even, in the daytime and their parents and elders were, received education in the evening. These are some school rooms in the uh, interior town, very important uh, historical city of Nizwa. The uh, basic law of the state, effectively Oman's constitution, states very clearly that education is a cornerstone for the progress of society, which the state fosters and endeavors to disseminate and make accessible to all. Transporting children to school everywhere in the kingdom, whether it be in the mountains, Oman is extremely mountainous, very rugged, dramatic terrain, or in the deserts. The state made it their business not to relocate people, which is rather interesting, but to reach out to the people and find them where they are or were and make these uh, amenities and facilities available to them, services. So from 1917 and 70 with no schools for girls by last year, 2019, the adult female literacy rate soared to approximately 95%. This is empowerment. Oman spends a good deal of its uh, GDP, 7% on education, which is uh, admired as being very, very high indeed. Education with a vengeance, both public and private. There are several universities in Oman, but the premier public university is Sultan Qaboos University, which was founded in 1986 and um, has approximately, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, uh, about 1,500 students in the capital of Muscat. There are more than 50% undergraduates uh, who are women at uh, SQU, 35% of all graduate students at Sultan Qaboos University are women. 62% of Omanis who study abroad are female. And of course, education in Oman is free, free for all, free until grades 12 and above, uh, including the uh, pub public university. Uh, when they study abroad, they are given scholarships and stipends. Note that in 1970, there were no publicly funded hospitals or health centers in Oman. Life expectancy in Oman was 47 years. Today, the life expectancy of the population at large is almost 78 years. This is in a 50 year time span with females living to the age of 80 approximately, ranking 47th in the world and being uh, celebrated by such organizations as, as the UNDP. There are more than 82 hospitals in Oman, more than 5,000 beds.
going to try to do something to my screen here. I hope I don't. There we go. Okay. Um, ah, now to women. Uh, state feminism in Oman began from the top down the moment that Qaboos bin Said assumed the throne. And he said, if the energy, capability, and enthusiasm of women were excluded from a country's active life, then that country would be depriving itself of 50% of its genius. And I prepared this slide many, many days ago, but after listening to the excellent presentations yesterday, I couldn't resist including this because Kabusa's statements echoed very closely what I heard yesterday about Noel Sadawi. Women are half of the society. You cannot have a revolution without women. You cannot have democracy without women. You cannot have equality without women. You cannot have anything without women. How has the state promoted and empowered women in Oman? Primarily by educating them, also by public pronouncements and affirmations from the highest leadership in the land, by appointing women to positions of leadership and by enacting laws. Along the lines of public pronouncements and affirmation, his Majesty, His Late Majesty Sultan Qaboos bin Said announced in 2008 that on October 17th of every year, Oman Women's Day would be celebrated. And so it is every year in a very grand way throughout the country. In my uh, manuscript, which is currently under construction, I spend a good deal of time talking about the challenges of political participation in, in Oman. And unfortunately, I can only give it a brief uh, a brief uh, acknowledgement today uh, by pointing out that women's political rights previously non-existent in the conservative Gulf states have undergone extraordinary growth in recent years. But I hasten to add there, not only women's political rights, but men's political rights as well, because this national development is something that has touched men and women equally. Oman does have a constitution, which is called the Basic Law or the Basic Statute of the State. It was announced in 1996, only 25 years ago. This is a, an ancient country, but a very new country in many ways. Um, the Basic Law established by Cameral Parliament, the Council of Oman, the Mejlis Oman, uh, with an upper house, which is appointed the Mejlis Adaula and the Mejlis Ashura, the elected lower house of parliament. There are many political firsts for Omani women. It was the first GCC country to grant women the right to vote. In 1994, women were invited to vote and stand for elections in the Mejlis Ashura. Two women were elected. Three years later, two women were appointed to the Mejlis Adaula. And in 2002, universal suffrage was granted to all Omani citizens over the age of 21. I've been a keen observer of political participation. And again, I'll just make some brief comments about this uh, today. Um, women have been allowed to canvas, at least uh, in terms of billboards and public uh, public signs. Um, there are no political deba debates, alas, but, uh, but this is one indication of uh, women um, um, as public faces of, of the political process. Now, alas, the record of Omanis in terms of political participation has not been stellar, but then again, I hasten to add, Oman is not unique in this context. In 2020, of the 85 members in the Mejlis Sadaula, 15 women have been appointed. Now, mind you, these are women appointed by His Majesty the Sultan. 
the public has the right to elect women to the Majlis Ashura. And last November, only two women of 85, two women filled 85 seats in the lower house of parliament. This is a subject that we could discuss for hours and hours clearly, but what are some of the social and cultural obstacles to women as candidates? Tribalism, patriarchy, family honor, attitudes, a lack of awareness and confidence, a lack of public exposure and political knowledge. Indeed, the idea of houses of parliament, elected members is new to the people of Oman. And from my interviews with scores and scores of women, most of them don't see that they're, um, they can advance their agency uh, significantly by becoming members of the political system. Rather, they see them themselves as advancing through education and workforce participation. Uh, another obstacle may be separate spaces in both public and private life. Another first for women in the GCC was the appointment in 2004 of Dr. Rauya, appointed Minister of Higher Education. Dr. Rauya has a DPhil from Oxford University and was the first female minister with portfolio in the Gulf. Um, she retired only this year. Currently, there are three women ministers of education, of higher education, and of social development. Now, when I speak with my feminist friends about this, they say, well, very nice, but you know, these are typically feminized portfolios. So why aren't there female ministers of commerce and defense and finance? And I think that's going to happen, but this is a first step in a very, very new process. They are, however, women in the public who serve as role models. Washington's first female ambassador from any Arab country was Her Excellency Hunayn ibn Sultan al Mughayri, who became ambassador to the US in 2005 and is just retiring this fall. Among her many achievements in Washington was the successful negotiation of the US Omani Free Trade Agreement. She was joined in the US for a very long time by her sister who uh, started her career as a media pioneer, uh, first in Egypt and then in Oman. Uh, she was a permanent representative of Oman to the UN and uh, went on to uh, represent her country in Germany. Ah, one comment I would like to make, if I may get back to the ambassadors, um, found this a rather interesting fact. Um, although Ambassador Hunayna was the first Arab woman to serve as ambassador to the US. She has been followed by several Middle Eastern female counterparts in Washington, uh, as well as others throughout the world. In 2020, there were four Arab women representing their countries at the ambassadorial level in the United States. Interestingly, all of them come from Middle Eastern monarchies, Jordan, Morocco, Oman, and Saudi Arabia. For women in the state of Oman, empowerment is a win-win equation. The national objectives of economic development require female participation. Women's empowerment is frequently framed as patriotic. If women succeed, the nation succeeds. Women themselves are empowered and fulfilled by their participation in the workforce, their independence, their financial independence, and so forth. As women contribute to national development, they gain agency. And again, how has the state promoted empowerment? By providing funding for women to start businesses, by establishing and promoting business organizations, by setting up social development agencies, such as the Oman Women's Organization a training, education, and volunteer organization, which today has some 65 branches throughout the country with more than 8,000 members. 
The Ministry of Social Development is charged with monitoring and supporting the needs of families. It oversees the Oman Women's Association, a vast network of volunteers consisting of more than 65 local chapters in communities throughout the country. It provides services and supports programs designed to foster greater empowerment and advancement among women through education, training, and legal services. It offers a range of programs, child welfare, information technology, financial and economic literacy, health and nutrition, and on and on. Professor Funch, there's um, just a couple of minutes left. Oh, I thought I had seven minutes. Okay. Really? Well, I will uh, do my best. So training centers for women, uh, NGOs, a great, a great tradition of volunteerism, uh, which many women have explained to me is inspired by Islamic precepts of charity and desire to give back to their country as well. Um, Gender discrimination is soundly prohibited in Oman. Equal pay for equal work, full maternity leave, paid leave for widows, early retirement age, and on and on. Uh, quickly, the sounds of breaking glass. Um, Omani women are routinely featured on Forbes' most powerful list, and here are many of them. Uh, Hin Bahwan, founder of Bahwan Cybertech, uh, has a master's degree from Harvard B School and has been celebrated throughout the world for her entrepreneurial um, excellence. And there are several um, government sponsored uh, programs to uh, again, inspire on the entrepreneurial spirit throughout the country. And I will just quickly point one thing out about Oman, which again distinguishes it from its, uh, from its sisters. In the, in the Gulf, which is that uh, women are in the workforce, certainly in other Gulf states, but um, Oman is again different because you will find women serving at every level in all professions in Oman as cashiers at supermarkets, at, bank, at banks, um, as baggage handlers at the airport, as drivers, as hotel receptionists, um, fulfilling every, level of the workforce very much um, uh, very much encouraged by the late uh, Sultan Qaboos bin Said. Uh, female engineers, I'll just go through these very quickly and skip to my conclusion. Airline pilots, taxi drivers, women in sports, the new Sultan, Sultan Haitham, is very, very interested in sports, has always been, and helped to organize the first women's soccer team in 2005. Omani women have been represented at the Olympics. They play tennis around the world professionally. Indeed, drag racers. And then of course, in the professional fields of science and medicine and engineering, um, Omani women are uh, everywhere evident. I would be remiss if I didn't pay special tribute to Joha al Harthi, who won the Man Booker International Prize. We talked a few moments ago about women authors. I think we should give a shout out to Celestial Bodies, which was translated by uh, Marilyn Booth. Joha, Harthi is the first Arabic author to win this prestigious award and the first Omani woman to have a novel translated into English. And then my friend Navira Al Harthi, who was the first Omani woman to scale Mount Everest also last year. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um, the cultural veneer is something I speak about very, very often in my writing and in my talks. Tradition and modernization are not necessarily in opposition. This is a false dichotomy. They are not static, they are dynamic, and they can intersect. In the case of Oman, I think this is a good example of how they've done that. Where women can be both modern and traditional, where Islamic values and feminism are not necessarily in conflict, where modernity and progress should not be measured by a woman's appearance, Indeed, women can assume multiple identities, 
multiple feminisms. This has been acknowledged by the United Nations Development Program. And the new Sultan, Sultan Haitham bin Tariq Saeed, has resolved to continue in the path of his illustrious predecessor and continue with the development of the country and all of its people, men and women alike. Over the past 50 years, women in the Sultanate of Oman have responded to the call to participate in national development, eagerly embracing the opportunities that have been made available to them by an enlightened leader. Since 1970, they have passed milestones that would have been unthinkable to their grandmothers. At the same time, they have embraced a model, a balance of culturally authentic modernization, one which is not at odds with their heritage and culture. Throughout history, women have been an integral part of Oman's success. In this modern era, challenges remain to be sure Yet my research and observations over the course of many years have revealed a strength, a determination, and an optimism that is exceptional in the region. Put simply, the women of Oman, much like the men of Oman, are comfortable in their own skin, facing the future with confidence and eager to move forward. Thank you. Okay, let us uh, let's clap for the doctor. Okay, uh, uh, I I just want. Uh, okay, go ahead. You want to say something? We am, um, please. No, this was very inspiring. Thank you, everybody. All right, thank you very much for sharing and also for your contribution uh, to this uh, conference. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, one related to this uh, presentation. I uh, actually would like also to, to mention a couple of things. One is that uh, Zuha Al-Harithi has contributed to our journal. In fact, oh. the first article is by her. So um, uh, if you are interested, just go to our uh, Arab, Arabic and World Literature, AWL, and you will find that the first article published by us is written by her Mabruk. and yes and it's uh, under the title intriguing desiring arabs which is you could see the double entendre in here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. arabs who desire and arabs who are the object of desire may i ask a question Just, Come on. sorry may i ask a question so can yes you, it has can, to be can very big. yeah can you can you highlight a little bit your project it means your journal, you know, because I would oh, like- Oh, you mean, yeah. oh, you're asking me. Oh, yeah. right, all right, all oh, right, of course, of course. Well, in this case, I can take a lot, uh, you know, the time I want. Of course not. <laughs> all right, 